This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Letters of Two Brides by Honoré de Balzac. Letter 3. The Same to the Same. December. My darling, here I am, ready to make my bow to the world. By way of preparation I have been trying to commit all the follies I could think of, before sobering down for my entry. This morning I have seen myself, after many rehearsals, well and duly equipped, stays, shoes, curls, dress, ornaments, all in order. Following the example of duelists before a meeting, I tried my arms in the privacy of my chamber. I wanted to see how I would look, and had no difficulty in discovering a certain air of victory and triumph, bound to carry all before it. I mustered all my forces, in accordance with that splendid maxim of antiquity, Know thyself, and boundless was my delight in thus making my own acquaintance. Griffith was the sole spectator of this doll's play, in which I was at once doll and child. You think you know me? You are hugely mistaken. Here is a portrait, then, René, of your sister, formerly disguised as a Carmelite, now brought to life again as a frivolous society girl. She is one of the greatest beauties in France, Provence, of course, excepted. I don't see that I can give a more accurate summary of this interesting topic. True, I have my weak points, but were I a man I should adore them. They arise from what is most promising in me. When you have spent a fortnight admiring the exquisite curves of your mother's arms, and that mother, the Duchesse de Chaulieu, it is impossible, my dear, not to deplore your own angular elbows. Yet there is consolation in observing the fineness of the wrist, and a certain grace of line in those hollows, which will yet fill out and show plump, round, and well modelled under the satiny skin. The somewhat crude outline of the arms is seen again in the shoulders. Strictly speaking, indeed, I have no shoulders, but only two bony blades sticking out in harsh relief. My figure also lacks pliancy. There is a stiffness about the side-lines. Poof! There's the worst out. But then the contours are bold and delicate. The bright, pure flame of health bites into the vigorous lines. A flood of life and of blue blood pulses under the transparent skin, and the fairest daughter of Eve would seem a negress beside me. I have the foot of a gazelle. My joints are finely turned, my features of a Greek correctness. It is true, madame, that the flesh tints do not melt into each other, but at least they stand out clear and bright. In short, I am a very pretty green fruit, with all the charm of unripeness. I see a great likeness to the face in my aunt's old missal, which rises out of a violet lily. There is no silly weakness in the blue of my insolent eyes. The white is pure mother-of-pearl, prettily marked with tiny veins, and the thick, long lashes fall like a silken fringe. My forehead sparkles, and the hair grows deliciously. It ripples into waves of pale gold, growing browner towards the centre, whence escape little rebel locks, which alone would tell that my fairness is not of the insipid and hysterical type. I am a tropical blonde, with plenty of blood in my veins, a blonde more apt to strike than to turn the cheek. What do you think the hairdresser proposed? He wanted, if you please, to smooth my hair into two bands, and place over my forehead a pearl, kept in place by a gold chain. He said it would recall the Middle Ages. I told him I was not aged enough to have reached the middle, or to need an ornament to freshen me up. The nose is slender, and the well-cut nostrils are separated by a sweet little pink partition, an imperious mocking nose, with a tip too sensitive ever to grow fat or red. Sweetheart, if this won't find a husband for a dowerless maiden, I'm a donkey. The ears are daintily curled, a pearl hanging from either lobe would show yellow. 
The neck is long, and has an undulating motion full of dignity. In the shade the white ripens to a golden tinge. Perhaps the mouth is a little large, but how expressive! What a colour on the lips! How prettily the teeth laugh! Then, dear, there is a harmony running through all. What a gait! What a voice! We have not forgotten how our grandmother's skirts fell into place without a touch. In a word, I am lovely and charming. When the mood comes, I can laugh one of our good old laughs, and no one will think the less of me. The dimples, impressed by comedy's light fingers on my fair cheeks, will command respect. Or I can let my eyes fall, and my heart freeze under my snowy brows. I can pose as a Madonna with melancholy swan-like neck, and the painter's virgins will be nowhere. My place in heaven would be far above them. A man would be forced to chant when he spoke to me. So you see, my panoply is complete, and I can run the whole gamut of coquetry from deepest bass to shrillest treble. It is a huge advantage not to be all of one piece. Now my mother is neither playful nor virginal. Her only attitude is an imposing one, when she ceases to be majestic, she is ferocious. It is difficult for her to heal the wounds she makes, whereas I can wound and heal together. We are absolutely unlike, and therefore there could not possibly be rivalry between us, unless indeed we quarrelled over the greater or less perfection of our extremities, which are similar. I take after my father, who is shrewd and subtle. I have the manner of my grandmother and her charming voice, which becomes falsetto when forced, but is a sweet-toned chest-voice at the ordinary pitch of a quiet talk. I feel as if I had left the convent to-day for the first time. For society I do not yet exist, I am unknown to it. What a ravishing moment! I still belong only to myself, like a flower just blown, unseen yet of mortal eye. In spite of this, my sweet, as I paced the drawing-room during my self-inspection, and saw the poor cast-off school-clothes, a queer feeling came over me. Regret for the past, anxiety about the future, fear of society, a long farewell to the pale daisies which we used to pick and strip of their petals in light-hearted innocence. There was something of all that, but strange fantastic visions also rose, which I crushed back into the inner depths, whence they had sprung, and whither I dared not follow them. My Renée, I have a regular trousseau. It is all beautifully laid away and perfumed in the cedar-wood drawers, with lacquered front of my charming dressing-table. There are ribbons, shoes, gloves, all in lavish abundance." My father has kindly presented me with the pretty gewgaws a girl loves, a dressing-case, toilette-service, scent-box, fan, sunshade, prayer-book, gold-chain, cashmere shawl. He has also promised to give me riding-lessons, and I can dance. To-morrow, yes, to-morrow evening, I come out. My dress is white muslin, and on my head I wear a garland of white roses in Greek style. I shall put on my Madonna face. I mean to play the simpleton, and have all the women on my side. My mother is miles away from any idea of what I write to you. She believes me quite destitute of mind, and would be dumbfounded if she read my letter. My brother honours me with a profound contempt, and is uniformly and politely indifferent. He is a handsome young fellow, but melancholy and given to moods. I have divined his secret— though neither the duke nor duchess has an inkling of it. In spite of his youth and his title, he is jealous of his father. He has no position in the state, no post at court. He never has to say, I am going to the chamber. I alone in the house have sixteen hours for meditation. My father is absorbed in public business and his own amusements. My mother, too, is never at leisure. No member of the household practices self-examination. They are constantly in company, and have hardly time to live. I should immensely like to know what is the potent charm wielded by society to keep people prisoner from nine every evening till two or three in the morning, and force them to be so lavish alike of strength and money. 
when I longed for it, I had no idea of the separations it brought about, or its overmastering spell. But then, I forget, it is Paris which does it all. It is possible, it seems, for members of one family to live side by side and know absolutely nothing of each other. A half-fledged nun arrives, and in a couple of weeks has grasped domestic details, of which the master diplomatist at the head of the house is quite ignorant. Or perhaps he does see, and shuts his eyes deliberately, as part of the father's role. There is a mystery here which I must plumb. End of Letter 3 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On October 29, 2006, in Oceanside, California.